All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Dion Aminata, Director of Strategic Initiatives at Illustrative Mathematics, and one of the lead authors of the IMK5 Math Curriculum. We have a lot in store today, so we're gonna get right to it. We're gonna be talking about the role of student think the role that student thinking plays in math instruction. This topic is extremely important to us at IM because we've designed our curricula, curricular materials with the belief that all students are capable learners with valuable ideas. And when we take the time to listen to those ideas, they can help students develop their own understanding of new mathematical concepts. And we're really, really excited today because to help us unpack this topic, for the first time ever, I'm has brought together an amazing panel of leading math education experts and practitioners. They'll discuss the importance of centering student thinking in mathematics in the classroom and share their experiences with making the shift to a problem-based instructional approach. During this discussion, please feel free to use the chat feature to make comments and the Q&A feature to ask questions about our materials and or of our panelists. This event has been made accessible through live captioning and to gain access to captions, you can click on the live transcript icon on your Zoom screen and select show subtitles and you'll see it right there. So to help frame the importance of today's discussion, a focus on student thinking, we'll hear a video message from CEO and co-founder, Bill McCallum, and here we go. Welcome, welcome to the second webinar in our series about the IMK5 curriculum. Today we are focusing on student thinking. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how we've been thinking at IM about what comes next now that we've written the curriculum. You know, the IM curriculum has been designed with a problem-based instructional model in mind. And one of the things that we want to think about is what we call the IM classroom. So that's a classroom that is using our curriculum, but it's a classroom where that instructional model is really visible, where you can see students working on problems being given an opportunity to try them before they're told how to, uh, told how to solve the problem. Um, students are sharing their thinking, they're sharing their thinking with each other or in groups or with the whole class. The teacher is noticing different student work and if, when, when important, helping students with uh, prompting questions. Um, the student is orchestrating the, project, uh, the discussions around problem solving. Uh, there is uh, an opportunity for all students to share their thinking. Uh, all students are heard. Uh, the student sees all students as capable mathematicians. And that's, that, that's our dream right now. Um, uh, and, we're, and we're thinking about how to, how to, how to help that come about uh, in U.S. classrooms. You know, it's not necessarily the traditional uh, model of instruction in this country. And so making that shift is difficult. So today you'll be hearing from people who talk about making that shift. We've done everything we can in the writing the materials to support making that shift. But that doesn't mean that it's easy. And so you'll be hearing from people who have experienced it. You'll be hearing from um, a panel with some of our authors, some people from our advisory board, uh, people in our professional learning department. I think it's going to be a great and rich discussion, and I hope you get a lot out of it. Thank you. I could not have said that any better. This is the work. And as Bill mentioned, we have big dreams and hopes for math instruction in our, in our nation. With, we start with the belief that all students are capable learners. We believe that all students should play with mathematical ideas before formalization. They have experiences and ideas that are valuable. They can make sense of math and solve problems. And they can learn grade level mathematics. They learn by interacting with others. When we start with these beliefs, we can begin to make the shift towards a focus on student thinking and imagine a world where all learners know, use, and enjoy mathematics. Before we get to our panel discussion, we'd like to share some of the features of the curriculum that support the focus on student thinking. 
We have been fortunate at IM to have such an awesome set of math education, math educators join us as certified professional learning facilitators. Maureen O'Connell is one of them. She's going to share IM's unique problem-based instructional model and demo an instructional routine with you. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. All right. Thank you, Dion. Teachers and leaders who experienced IMK to five and pilots witnessed how the curriculum structure builds positive math identity and elevates discourse to make student thinking visible. It positions all students as capable learners of math. I'm excited to share just a fraction of how this occurs with IMK to five. So what does it mean when IM says it is a curriculum, it, the curriculum is problem-based? Students learn math by doing math. Take a moment to explore this cycle. What do you notice? What do you wonder? In each IM activity or lesson, the teacher launches the task so that students can work independently and then share their thinking with a partner or a small group. And finally, with the teacher's help, consolidate in the synthesis component. IM's problem-based curriculum and overarching design structure, invitation, deep study, consolidate, is how students learn from problems. Applying this structure leads to learning. The design welcomes all students to the map with invitations at the activity, lesson, and the unit level. It creates an asset-focused curriculum where everyone has ideas about math, and these ideas are valued. The curriculum materials include classroom structures that support students in taking risks, engaging in discourse, productively struggling, and making sense of problems. They participate in ways that make their ideas visible. So again, when we consider teaching and learning with IM, we consider a cycle. And the problem-based teaching and learning cycle leverages teachers and students as partners in learning. IM's problem-based approach aligns well with Zaretta Hammond's culturally responsive lesson structure, ignite, chunk, chew, and review. This IM lesson structure remains consistent across units and grade levels, supporting students' focus on the math content, not on what's going to happen in math class today. Numerous IM K-5 design features help make thinking, student thinking visible. The lesson warm-up, a welcoming math content routine, is especially impactful. And these are the 10 routines found in IM K-5. IM intentionally chose to use a small set of instructional routines to ensure that they are used frequently enough to become truly routine. This benefits teachers as well as students. Once again, knowing the routines lessens cognitive load and frees everyone to focus on the mathematical ideas in the lesson. Let's try a warm up instructional routine. This is the welcome part of a grade three, unit five lesson focusing on non unit fractions. What do you notice? What do you wonder? In the classroom, we take one minute of quiet think time. I'll let you think now, not for a minute. And in, when you're ready, turn and tell a partner, even an invisible partner, your notice or your wonder. It's important that all of the students put their math thinking into the air at this point. I welcome you to type some of your ideas into the chat, but don't send them yet. Type and then hold. 
okay? So what do you notice? What do you wonder? Put those third grade shoes on. All right, go ahead and send them. Uh, my friend Heather has a notice. She is saying that she noticed that the squares are partitioned into four sections. I wonder why only some are shaded. So Heather, let me see if I can capture that thinking here. So on the notices, the squares partitioned into four sections. And then let's do a wonders on this side. Let's put the wonders down here. Why only some parts shaded? Thank you. Any Fetter has noticed that there are, let's get a different color here again, that we have one, two, three, and four parts of color. Thanks, Annie. Hey, Heather Haynes is wondering what comes next. She's wondering if five fourths would be the next representation. John also was wondering what would the next box be? Let's get that thinking recorded. Greta noticed that it's more shaded as we go across. So Greta, are you, I wanna make sure I understand your thinking. Um, are you thinking what Heather, um, what Annie mentioned, that the number of shaded boxes are increasing as we move to the left? Okay. Christy Martin said that she noticed that the, the white is decreasing as we go from left to right. White typing on. That's not going to work. All right, let's see. Oh, Jean. Jean Reynolds noticed that only one of these four squares has a, a fraction under it. She noticed a number under the third box. Um, and I'm going to ask you. What do you think the three and the four stand for in this number below this third box? Did somebody answer me? What do you think the three and the four stand for in the number below the third square? So Sherry said she thinks that this represents the one. Let's do this in a different color. She noticed this is in the one, two, and three blue boxes. Um, and Teresa also thinks that three is the number of blue boxes. And uh, Elham and Leanne said that it is four parts in all. So let's see if we can say out of one, two, three, four in all. Sometimes we shade more than one part. And we can describe the shaded part with a number like this one. We'll learn more about this number in the next activity. So you could see um, in this ab abbreviated experience, the purpose of this warm up was to elicit the idea that fractions are made up of unit fractions. And when students articulate what they notice at wonder, they have an opportunity to attend to the precision in their precision in language and to describe what they see, incorporating the math practices, MP6 here. They might first propose less formal or imprecise language and then restate their observation after they discuss with peers and teachers in that cycle we talked about in the discussion cycle. Um, there's just so many wonderful notices and wonders. I wish I could record them all. I need you. You're all wonderful mathematicians. 
now I'm going to clear this thinking and move us to this question. How did this routine ignite students' mathematical thinking? So this is the 10-minute the warm-up at the beginning of that lesson. How did the routine ignite students' mathematical thinking? What teacher move helped to invite everyone to share their mathematical ideas? Uh, you could respond in the chat if you like. I love that you're still noticing and wondering. That's what happens in class. You need to use a timer because these warm-ups are so engaging and you want everyone's ideas. Um, all students are expected to get their thinking out into the room. Yes. Uh, Heather said, my pausing before entering on the chat helped us all to participate. So thank you, Heather. So first you had that opportunity to have, in real life, you'd have that full minute to organize your thinking. Then you do, as you said, have an opportunity to talk to someone about your thinking in a way of rehearsal. Um, in remote teaching, we had students just talk to the themselves or their dog or their little stuffed animal, but just that uh, math expression was so positive. Um, Sherry said, all ideas are welcome. And Jenny said, the routine invites students by starting at the same level. Can you say more about that, Jenny? Um, uh, but I, I think we've talked, everyone has uh, something to, to notice and to wonder. It gave everyone access to the problem. There's no right or wrong. Thinking is ignited. So you're going back to that culturally responsive teaching. Um, we really did kind of ignite their thinking about um, unit fractions and non-unit fractions. And then there, as, as many of you have mentioned, this routine is very collaborative because students are inspired by, by each other's thinking and it makes the learning very collaborative. Um, Josh said, I recorded the ideas as we said them and really listened. Thank you, Josh. I'm working on it. Um, so, and Greta said she had her original ideas, but then she felt challenged and inspired by the depth of other participants' ideas. So it really does, um, we do co-craft that, that learning. It really is better because we're all together. Okay, let's see. Um, did we get, did we, I think we got to say um, these items that you noticed and, and they're so wonderful. I wanna save this chat. Um, just a, a, a couple of more gems from the support for student thinking. I am supports students and their teachers. So in every lesson, teachers benefit from the guidance that supports us as we anticipate responses and work to really understand what students are thinking. Cues like this to monitor for, students who notice something or use a particular strategy, that helps us advance the lesson goal by having these students share their thinking and their work. And when we hear what students understand, we can better leverage the additional components in the curriculum that advance student thinking and position everyone as a successful learner of math. Here's an example of advancing student thinking. So notice how the prompts for, for the teacher are framed to support the student without spoiling the student's opportunity for discovery and create an understanding. And these are right in our lesson uh, teacher lesson materials. I am K to five lessons contain support to welcome all learners. Here are examples of specific guidance to increase access for students with disabilities and access for English learners. An IMK to five supports are aligned with the universal design for learning guidelines that support students as problem solvers and sense makers. In a problem-based mathematics cl classroom, sense making and language are interwoven and this amplifies math discourse. And it's supported by the use of the math language routines throughout the curriculum. I'm sure you'll hear more about these curriculum components from our fantastic panelists. Um, and so with that, thank you. And back to you, Dion.
Awesome. That was such an amazing demo for us. And I feel like I learned just so much in those few minutes. Uh, we're going to listen to a few teachers uh, share their experiences with using K-5 math and actually share their experience with, um, with the focus on student thinking. You may recognize someone in the video too. Hello, this is Soila Garcia. I am teaching intermediate level with Summerton School District in Arizona. Something I love about I am are those routines, the content routines, such as warm-ups, specifically those like um, notice and wonder or which one doesn't belong or the number talks. Those are giving my students lots of opportunities to contribute to the mathematical discussion. Um, I noticed that they feel at ease uh, talking about the concepts and also give me a lot of opportunities to assess their content needs, their language needs, or even some misconceptions. Thank you, I am, for this opportunity. Hello, my name is Amy Bork. I am a fourth grade teacher at Sergeant Bluff Luton Elementary School in Sergeant Bluff, Iowa. What makes I am unique is how it naturally builds in number sense and conceptual understanding at all levels with all students. It, it meets um, every child where they're at and allows the child to grow from that point forward. I am is unique. It is the only curriculum that brings all of the components together so that all students, no matter their background, their culture, um, their experience can be successful mathematicians down the road. Because of I am K-5, I am now a authentic listener as a classroom teacher. I've never mastered that before. I am now listening to my students think. I'm making them think in visual, and then I'm using what they've shown me to inform everything that I do. My students have now flipped that, and in turn, become better listeners and communicators with one another. And what that has shown in my classroom is that now my students feel valued and they're now learning more from each other than they did from me. How amazing is that? Because of IMK5, I have transformed my mathematics teaching practices. It has transformed my classroom and now math is the best part of my school day. My name is Leanne Reed. I'm a third grade teacher with the Cabot School District. One thing I love about IMK5 is its purposeful scope and sequence that better allows my students to make mathematical connections. Every student sees themselves as a mathematician because every student has an entry into the mathematical task. Work is rigorous in nature, so every student is challenged, but with a high ceiling and a low floor, every child can find success. I love IMK5. I'm Maureen O'Connell, math specialist at Paul F. Doyon Memorial School in Ipswich, Massachusetts. One of the things that I just think is so special about IM is its unique way of building a mathematical community. Um, as a teacher of 25 years, I've always prided myself on having a great class community, but I never even considered building a mathematical community. I didn't really think of it and I didn't have the the skills or the information on how to do it until I started with IM. Um, and now I feel like it's changed the way my students think of themselves. We're all members of a respectful, safe, caring mathematical community where students feel comfortable sharing their thinking, agreeing or respectfully disagreeing, and just have fun um, doing what mathematicians do. So it's made all the difference. So oh, great. And real experiences from real people just mean the world. And now, without further ado, Hello, we are going is... to, oops, not play that again, but we're going to our panel discussion. And I'm going to introduce our guests. We have Annie Fetter. She was a fan, founding member of the Math Forum until it ended in 2017. She earned the title of Notice and Wonder Woman when she worked with the team at the Math Forum to formalize the routine. Her current work focuses on sense-making and eliciting and leveraging student thinking and ideas. 
Welcome, Annie. We also have Christina Lincoln Moore. Um, Christina has been an educator for 26 years, currently pursuing her doctorate in math education. She is the principal of Sheremoya Avenue Elementary School in Hollywood, California, where they're currently in their first year of implementing IMK5 math. Welcome. Deborah Parrott is a math content specialist at Unbound Ed. She was one of the lead authors of the IMK5 math curriculum, leading the work of grade two. She's also an educator of over 30 years with experience in early learning, literacy, I said literacy, and math with a focus on practices to reduce math anxiety, build positive math identities in children and adults. She's also one of the co-founders of the hashtag Black Women Rock Math, created to lift the voices and expertise of Black women in math education. Welcome, Devorah. Elham Kazemi is a professor of mathematics education at the University of Washington. She studies how to build schools where teachers learn from and with their students. This work is informed by research on equity in mathematics education, children's mathematical thinking, and classroom practice. Welcome. Max Ray Rick has been on the staff of IM for several years, first as geometry curriculum writer, and then on the professional learning team. Before joining IM, Max worked for 10 years at the Math Forum with Annie Fetter, learning a ton about student thinking and problem solving. And he is the lead author of the book, Powerful, problem solving. Welcome, Max. Dr. Rachel Lambert is an assistant professor at special, in special education and mathematics education at the University of Southern, oh, sorry, the University of California, Santa Barbara. I want to get that one wrong. <laughs> the goal of her research and work with teachers is to increase access to meaningful mathematics for students with disabilities. Dr. Lambert worked as a special educator and inclusive general education teacher for over 10 years. And last but absolutely not least, we have Tisha Jones, who was a pilot teacher for the IMK5 math curriculum. She has over 15 years of experience teaching math from kindergarten through seventh grade, and she's currently teaching math methods courses at Georgia State University as well as working towards her PhD in elementary education with a focus on math. <laughs> Welcome everyone. So we're going to get started with our first question. And let me stop sharing this so you can see everyone's lovely face. The first question is, what are some benefits you've seen when student thinking is centered in the math classroom? Let's start with Annie. Gosh, I, I had all these things I was going to say that kind of got said in the, you know, in the lead up material. And so I, uh, to me, the big shift is that math um, shifts to something you do instead of something that's done to you. And, uh, and to illustrate that, I, I pulled out just a couple quotes. So I worked with a second grade class from this year teaching, um, sort of doing sense making lessons online. They've been doing sense making for three years, this school, and um, math is their favorite part of the day. They call math joyous, and it's because they can't wait to hear each other's ideas and to share their own. And it's almost like they'd rather hear other people's ideas than like, you know, it's like people who like to give presents instead of get them, right? Um, a fourth grader said uh, this year, I like them because we don't have to do math at all. We just need to think on it without stress, which doesn't really say much for other math, right? But, and then a second grader, I think said the best thing, um, this year when we asked them, what do you like about, you know, doing noticing and wondering, she said, you get to share your thinking and no one can ruin it. Mm. I'm just going to leave that right there. And, and, uh, you know, it just, they're, they're so sweet. And they were so like, they were bringing themselves to math class for every moment of that. And that was so important to them. So. And the kids will let you know, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Christina, let's go to you next. Annie, that was so awesome. I, I'm i just going to say, I love this book by mm -hmm. Dr. Francis Sue. And one of my favorite quotes is that 
you cannot separate what it means to be human with the practice of mathematics. And if that is the lens that we have and we filter all of our decisions. So when we look at our little humans in our classrooms, we know that this is a part of their human experience. And so of course we want to engage them and make them feel valued and heard and all those things that we're, we've been hearing. So if that's my lens, then this is just, you know, standard procedure, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Deborah, let's hear from you. Yeah, this is an exciting thing because I'm just so excited that I am is setting people up to kind of walk it out this way, even if they're not sure how to do it. It is baked right into the curriculum. And for me, many years ago, when I started to see student thinking as the center of the math classroom, math came alive. It became the favorite period. We could do extra math. Kids were doing math at recess. They were doing math all the time. But the most exciting piece was the collective agency that developed. They were all experts and they recognized that they didn't have to look to me for all of the answers, but that they could look to one another, that their ideas mattered, that even when they disagreed, that was okay. And that there wasn't just one right way to get to any solution and that it was okay to not have the right solution. There were just so many things that happened in the math classroom when students knew they could take the risks and not feel like someone's ruining their thinking, ruining their ideas, but they could debate about it. They could reason together about it. They could just enjoy doing the math. And my favorite thing is when math class was over and instead of, yes, I heard, oh, <laughs> I, I mean, math, come on now. You know what I'm talking about, third graders, fourth graders, being disappointed that math is ending. So just go for it, take the risk and let student thinking be the center. It's scary at first, but it'll be okay, I promise. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Elham, what are some benefits that you've seen? Well, first of all, I have goosebumps just listening to what has been shared because it's true. That's exactly the experience I have. And I am so excited to hear from the people in this panel. I would use the word invigorating. That's kind of how I feel when I'm in classrooms where kids are sharing their ideas with one another. And I think um, students know that they matter. They matter as full humans and they can show up however they are and they can put half-baked ideas out there and make them better with each other um, and ask new questions and follow paths. So there isn't a rush to be quick, to be fast, to be accurate. You just muck around, and um, but with intention. It's not like a free-for-all either. People are really purposefully working together, um, and it's joyful. And they see mathematics as something that is worth learning. And when we involve our families and our communities well, they know that math isn't something that's black and white, that is like a school thing. It's a life thing. It, it helps us um, understand our world better. It's connected to other subjects we teach. Um, questions we pursue, things we want to get done in our communities that matter. Um, so all of these things, I think, make school a place worth going to. That's what we want, right? We want to have school be a place that we love. Absolutely. Um, I want to hear from Max, but I also want to remind our attendees to um, go ahead and put questions for our panelists in the uh, Q&A so we can answer. There's gonna be a Q&A section um, shortly after our scheduled question. So um, we wanna hear from you. And Max, can you tell us what are some benefits you've seen when student thinking is centered in the math classroom? Yeah, all the things people have said. And one of the things I wanna add on is that um, it does a lot of work towards differentiation and it, We've talked some already about how it makes tasks more accessible when you do things like invite students to notice and wonder, center on their ideas, take away the pressure of right and wrong. It at the same time provides more challenge. Um, I mean, as teachers, we know that there's nothing harder than figuring out what someone else is thinking when they're saying it in their own words. 
And when we make that a collective project, it's not just the teacher's responsibility, but we're all responsible for figuring out what each other is thinking, making sense of it, finding the value in it. That builds community. It builds some of the skills that we need to um, have bigger conversations in our communities. Um, but it also means that the work of uh, inviting everyone's ideas in when it's collectively held provides challenge to all students as well as providing access to all students. And we're all doing that for each other. It's not just the teacher's job. Absolutely. Um, very, very well put. Uh, let's hear from Rachel. Hi. I'm thinking about this experience I had maybe two years ago, pre-COVID, where I walked into a special day class. So it's a class with students with disabilities. They're in fifth grade. They have this amazing teacher. And I'm just like, I can't wait to see her actually teach. I've had her in workshops and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's amazing. I cannot wait. So she gives them this problem. She just, you know, takes them into this problem with some images. The problem is that she's got like 12 cans of paint. She's got uh, each, she wants to paint some chairs. They each take three uh, fourths of a can of paint. Oh, it's going back to our notice and wonder. So each chair takes that much paint, right? How many chairs can she paint? This is a division of fractions problem. I'm thinking, I'm like, holy bananas. Like, this is amazing. It's simple. She gives no pre-teaching, but she takes them into the context, right? She sends them off. They all have different ways of sort of thinking through it. Some of them change three-fourths to one-fourth. She let them go with it, right? Every kid in that classroom solved it. Mm -hmm. These are all Latinx students with autism, intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, such as dyslexia. And I'm like standing there and I just wrote in my paper in the middle, I wrote, she trusts their thinking. Like that was it. I was like, what is she doing? Fundamentally, all she's doing is one thing. She's actually building a classroom around their thinking instead of telling them how to think. These are kids who have been told how to think in classroom after classroom after classroom. And that's like mainly what I wanted to say that like how I wrote that in the middle, what the most important work she does is to trust them because then all of these other benefits are coming from every that everyone's talked about comes from that trust. Like you, you can think and your thinking is gonna unravel this mathematics for yourself. Absolutely, uh, such a powerful statement. And what does the, that child feel when they know that you trust them? Thank you for that. Tisha. So we've all had our students do some work and come up to us and say, is this right? Um, and I, I've absolutely had those kids that that's, I, I had kids like actually stare very intently into my face as if they're trying to decipher if their, their, their answer is correct from the look in my eyes. Um, and throughout the course of the, the year, them beginning to understand that I am not the keeper of the right answers, that they can know for themselves when their answers are correct. And then as they're grappling with these problems that are rich and interesting, um, those aha moments that come and the pride on their faces and in their bodies and when they want to go and share everything that they just figured out is like, you just can't match that. Um, and you only get that when you center their thinking and you give them opportunities to go at it, however, you know, and bring whatever prior knowledge, whatever they've got coming with them to each problem. Um, and the other thing that I love is, are the connections that you can make. So often we spend so much time like teaching concepts in isolation, but when you open things up with like a notice and wonder or which one doesn't belong, all of a sudden you're now making connections. The kids are bringing in connections because somebody thought about subtraction or somebody thought about multiplication and division. And you're like, look at how these are connected. And maybe that wasn't even what you were gonna talk about, but because it's natural and it's organic, you have this opening to have those conversations. Um, so it really just allows for the brilliance of our students to shine through. And to me, that is my favorite, favorite part of centering student thinking. So, so very well put. And, you know, coming from your teaching experience, that's, it's just amazing to hear 
I am going to share my screen because I wanted us to think about this quote uh, from Children's Mathematics, Cognitively Guided, Guided Instruction by Thomas Carpenter at Alia. Um, Working toward equity in mathematics learning requires attention to not only how a student thinks about mathematics, but also all aspects of who the student is and the resources a student brings to learning, as well as how school and societal structures shape a student's opportunities to learn. Just wanted to put this quote out here and see if any of you wanted to take up and react to this quote. Elham, want to start us off? Sure. This is like a, a dense quote, right? And you have to imagine a lot into it. And I'm um, I'm thinking about the story Rachel just told, um, and also thinking about um, how we, for example, approach the idea of whether children are ready for something. School readiness, kindergarten readiness, these ways that we want to kind of assess and determine where students' starting points are, but sometimes that forecloses um, because we start to categorize our students as certain kinds of thinkers or, um, or they're low or high learners or, they, um, or we view their disability only through a deficit perspective and not as a what can they do and how can they enter these tasks. So I think when we think about school structures that shape an opportunity to learn, um, our grouping practices, our ways of trying to figure out what students know can really close down opportunities. And we have to question and reflect on those practices if we are going to really honor and trust that students have ideas and that we need to figure out what they are as a starting point. Absolutely, thank you. I'd like to add on to that. The theme for my school year at my school is unexpected learning so that we move away from the narrative of learning loss. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of what was just said about those structures, you know, are we coming from a place of deficit? Oh, they're like two years behind. I'm going to have to do. No, we're going to move forward. We're going to see where they are and then we're going to advance them. And I think that's very important for all of us this school year is to not have that as our focus that, you know, we're trying to make up for learning loss. But there is a lot of things. I had kindergartners navigating professional platforms. I mean, there's, there's so many things that did happen. So we just want to build on that and bring that joy back um, to mathematics. Thank you. And I'll jump in. And for me, I'm thinking about the CGI framework. You know, cognitively guided instruction is often viewed as this thing over here that happens by itself and nothing else can go with it. But I had the opportunity to follow the required curriculum that my school said we all needed to use. But having been immersed in cognitively guided instruction and graduate courses and experimenting in the classroom and understanding that a part of the framework is anticipating student thinking and questioning students and allowing them to work independently, then work in groups and then justify their reasoning. All of the things that go into CGI and that instruction, we were considering those things when we were writing the curriculum. And I know for me, I brought that with me, my classroom experience to thinking about how I wrote story problems. And, and as a team, we got together to talk about what we're hoping to get out of it. But we also considered very carefully the contexts, how it related to the students, the student, where they live, their communities, not just windows, not just mirrors. And the new thing I learned on social media and sliding glass doors, mm -hmm. that is so powerful that I see myself in the mathematics. I glimpse into the lives of others through a window, but I'm safe. And then I choose to slide the glass door open, step across and make connections. Mm -hmm. All of those things working together is the thing that brings equity and just stamps the fact that all tasks belong to all students. All students can do grade level work. 
All students have mathematical ideas they are bringing with them. Growing up in New York City, I knew 10 year olds who were responsible for taking the bus and bringing the younger sibling and having the right change and going to do the laundry at the laundromat. You can't tell me that those students aren't bringing mathematical ideas when they've had to navigate math in their lives every day. So for me, this quote automatically made me think of the beautiful meshing together of the CGI framework with our curriculum and, and just all of those ideas. So I'm so excited, so excited. Can I just give a credit to this Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop with mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. <laughs> that metaphor just absolutely changed my life. <laughs> so many things are sliding glass doors. Um, and I appreciate that very, very much. And thank you for, for providing that reference. Um, I'm going to move us on to our next question. Um, and the question is, in your experience, what are some challenges with shifting to a problem-based approach? All right, so um, we, need, we need to hear all the challenges, please. So <laughs> uh, if you, you want to get us started, Tisha? Yeah, I can get us started. Um, I think one of the things is, you know, we often think about math. Um, it can feel very linear, right? Like it's like, okay, you learn addition and then you learn subtraction, you add onto this. And um, problem base is not linear. It's, you know, there, it's this up and down and it takes time. Um, and it really takes time for kids to adapt to it. It takes time for kids to go through that problem solving. It's not the same as like learning the, the steps of computation. So, you know, you may, where we can kind of see this linear progression a lot of times with computation and procedures, um, problem solving doesn't really work that way. You know, they may get one problem and they, they nail it and it's amazing. And then the next problem they're lost and they have no idea where to start. And as teachers, we have to kind of be flexible and open to this process and, and this journey that they're going on um, and that it may take a little bit longer to really show for them to get comfortable and show their what they know more consistently, but also keeping faith that it will happen. It is, you know, by the end of the year, you do start to see, and it's mind blowing when it does. So just stick with it, even when it feels like it's going really slow. Absolutely. Can I just add on to what Tisha said? And as the administrator, I need to know that because when I go in, I shouldn't just, I want, I, I want to check off this list and say, oh, but to really be aware of that to help the teacher grow as well as the students. So I have to create that environment where that is okay. And that's really hard in our testing culture. But it's, it's like trying to find that balance where the teacher has the freedom to and not be afraid that, oh, this is going to take more than two days to do this lesson, but on here it says do it, you know. So it's, it's both parts working with each other so that we can, you know, help students succeed. Very, very, very important. Uh, I want to know, how can we leverage student thinking to guide unfinished instruction? And I think Rachel has an answer for us. In that. Oh, yeah, the answer. Super <laughs> Just kidding, it's not easy at all. Um, however, it is what we have to do, right? So I am a little worried about all of us this year. I think Christina really brings it home in terms of like what administrators might ask of us or expect of us as we are moving forward with a problem-based curriculum, trying to center, trust kids thinking, get them to trust their own thinking. Oh, it's so beautiful. This stuff is beautiful, truly beautiful. But there's gonna be all these forces like evil. It's like the, the imperial forces are gonna be like, on you and they're gonna be like where's your pacing chart and what about learning loss have you mapped it and where are your, all your charts of all the loss and all the gaps and all of that see that's evilness and that's going to be coming at you from all sides um so how do what how do we deal with that well first of all you need to know yourself what needs to be done and then you need to be able to explain it to other people and one of the things that i think we can i bet everybody here agrees with is that 
the only way out of the situation for kids to help them with whatever they need to learn next, whether it's two grades ahead or like what they maybe missed last year, is that we need to invest in them understanding. We need to start where they are. We have to figure out where their brain is with different topics and what makes sense to them. And then we can only build on that. That is literally the only way they're going to learn. There's no other way. There's no way to stuff it in quick, quick, right? So we have to resist stuffing it in quick, quick through the evil empire. And we're going to have to especially resist that for kids who are more, who the structure, I love how Christina is laughing at me. <laughs> but I love, um, we're going to have to resist that more for those who which the structure of school is more regressive and trust their thinking less. So that means that we're going to get messages from like the IES practice guide, for example, which I get a lot of emails about, about using direct instruction only at this time, right? But we know that kids learn from what they know, right? Including kids with disabilities. We all basically learn in the same way, even though we learn differently. We learn building on problems. So we have to begin there. And so intervention needs to begin with children's thinking, right? That did not answer your question, but it told you who to be afraid of. <laughs> the empire. <laughs> oh no, that totally answered my question. Um, and as Amy Anderson said in the chat, she said, st students are so much more than a test score. And so we have to avoid the evil. <laughs> and really Dion, I wanted to add something in, in terms of the challenges, because I think this comes at the, from a sort of different perspective. Uh -huh. There are lots of kids who are good at school, right? They've figured out school. They figured out how school works. You are changing school if you shift math to be about what they bring and not what you're just going to tell them and they can pair it back. Mm -hmm. Some of those kids are going to be very unhappy with you. And a lot of those kids are the kids whose parents will complain and say, you're not teaching math right. So, you know, that that's sort of a challenge that you don't expect is the good kids going like, wait a minute, what have you done with math class? Right. So that that's something to like stick to it and go like, well, let, let me tell you what I've done with math class. Let's talk about it. forget that I'm trying to explain that we're leaving 85 percent of the kids out. I just made up that number. But, you know, you can't tell them that. But saying, oh, well, this will be better for everyone. But they they won't think so at first. They will be unhappy because I've seen that, you know, it, you don't have to look hard to see that. No, that I think that um, Nancy's point in the chat is also true because it's a it's a two way street creating a um, a classroom community where people can take risks right it's risky for teachers and it's risky for kids and I think teachers and kids have to sh to share their fears with one another what's scary about listening and sharing and putting your ideas out there and that time that you take building community in the first six to eight weeks of school, like what's happening right now is so vital, right? And the teacher who responds to a kid when they share their thinking, which happened to my own daughter with, really, you think that? Is never gonna speak again. She will never speak in your class again if that's how you respond to her. And so, so there, are, there are real risks and people have to, be able to air them out with one another in order to say, we're willing to take that step in. And we have to think about how to do that together. So, so, so true. And we have actually been answering our next question, which is what advice do you have for teachers and leaders who want to make the shift to a problem-based approach? Um, Can I start with that one? Because I'm going to add on to what I'm um, just said in, in regards to leaders. To me, just like we want to highlight student thinking as a, a leader, I have to highlight teacher thinking. I have to model what I want to see teachers do in the classroom. So one of the things that I'm going to do today, I mean, do this year is create as a co-create with my teachers, the observation form. I want them to be able to evaluate themselves, just like we want our students to become um, self, to have self-management and um, evaluate themselves. So me as a leader, I have to be vulnerable and say, okay, let, let's do this together. And so I have to be the model. And um, that's hard because it's, you're vulnerable, people might not like you, they'll, you know, all these things. But if I really am gonna 
you know, walk the, what is it? Talk the talk, I gotta walk the walk. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Max, do you wanna uh, jump in here? What advice might you have for teachers and leaders who, who wanna make the shift to a problem-based approach? Yeah, I think I saw a question scroll by in the chat too for, you know, if you're transitioning from, there's so many different starting points that people are at or points in their journey. Um, if you're transitioning from like an I do, you do, we do model, that's very different than if you're transitioning from like sort of everyone pulls resources from different places on the internet that you like and there's a lot of routines and three act tasks, but you're sort of looking for, we want like a coherent curriculum that takes us through the standards, right? So there's different starting points. Um, and I might like just call Elham out and ask her to add on to this because one of the people that I've learned a lot from is uh, her collaboration with Tracy Johnson Zager in Maine and the way that they rolled out a curriculum implementation over several years and started with helping teachers get really good at eliciting, eliciting and being curious about student thinking. And they started that with routines and using the five practices. And then as teachers and students got more curious about how do these ideas build on each other and connect and how do we connect them to learning goals, then a curriculum was a really natural answer to that. And the routines and the five practices built into the curriculum already felt familiar. But it started with how do we all get curious about and good at thinking about student thinking. And that took at least a year. I don't know how long, but that's been really inspiring to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have not a lot of time <laughs> left, <laughs> um, but uh, this conversation has been so, so very amazing. Um, we are going to actually go ahead and close out with a quote. Um, let me share my screen again so you can see the quote. And it speaks to some of the things that were discussed today. Um, Dr. Maya Angelou says, people will forget what you said, people will forget, will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I love Dr. Maya Angelou the simple act of listening to students can make even the most marginalized students feel included. And when they feel like a part of the mathematical community, they're actively shaping their mathematical identities in positive ways. And I'm saying it and our attendees are saying it in the comments. This was a truly amazing discussion. And thank you, thank you, thank you again. The conversation does not stop here. This webinar is the second of a series of five webinars hosted by IM. We place high priority on exploring relevant topics and engaging with math leaders in conversations that affect today's students and educators. These conversations serve as a pathway to realizing our vision of a world where all learners know, use, and enjoy mathematics. If you missed the first webinar, you can catch it on demand at illustrativemathematics.org. You can also become a part of the IAM community by joining our email list. That way you can stay connected with us and get the latest updates on our upcoming events, products, and services. We also want to thank our, um, our uh, certified uh, partners, Kendall Hunt and uh, Lauren Zillian. And uh, we want to give them a special thank you because they are the only ones who are providing the certified versions of the IMK5 math curriculum. Special thank you to IM certified facilitator Maureen O'Connell, technical producer Christy Cavender, and K5 author Alex Clayton for facilitating the Q&A in the chat. And of course, thank you to our amazing panel of math experts. And thank you for joining us today. I had an amazing time as your host today, just about as much fun as I'm having in this picture right here. Don't forget to follow us on social media and add the hashtag learn with I am when you share your thoughts on Twitter, Facebook, or wherever else you want to share it. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>